Thank you. Can you hear me and see my slides? Um, somebody tell me if you can't. And I'm uh, very much steeped in Wales at the moment. Uh, last evening, I was invited by the Bevan Society to give the Bevan Lecture uh, because of the 75th anniversary. Here I am speaking to the Bevan Commission. And when I leave this meeting, I'm moving on to the Constitutional Commission for Wales. So steeped in it, and I'm going to indulge. Uh, I prepared this to think about Bevan last evening, and I'm going to give the same lecture to you today. Uh, <clears throat> apologies if anyone in the audience was there last evening. We think, of course, about Bevan, uh, not just because this is the Bevan Commission, but because of the 75th anniversary of the NHS. Everyone, of course, is talking about the NHS. Um, the opening line of my book, The Health Gap, was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. My concern is with the social determinants of health, the conditions that make people sick. And it's not NHS or social determinants. They work together. These are data from England by level of deprivation spend on NHS. Here you've got the least deprived. And then as you move down the social gradient, the spend on the NHS gets higher. Not, I hasten to add, because poorer people are overusing the healthcare system. And therefore, as one former Secretary of State for Health said, we should charge them, stop them using it. Not because they're overusing it, but because they've got more illness. In fact, Gordon Brown's think tank in Scotland calculated that people in the poorest quintile had more than 60% higher preventable hospital admissions than people in the top quintile. If everyone in the top quintile, if everyone in Scotland had the level of preventable hospital admissions as the top quintile, you could do with 10% fewer hospital beds. Same picture in England and in Wales. In other words, one way of relieving pressure on the National Health Service is to take action on the social determinants of health. This quote from Bevan is really my theme. If the wages system alone was the sole means whereby the social product reached the individual citizen, it would reach him as unequally as the wages are unequal. But social services give people a share of the national product in accordance with their need. I'm not wise enough to know what the appropriate salary differential should be in society. I guess most of us expect, um, accept that there are salary differentials. But if that meant that people share of what is necessary to have a decent, flourishing life was dependent on that inequality in salary and wage income, then there would be inequality in the basic service provision. And that's absolutely fundamental. And I think that Bevan principle, which applies to the NHS, we should apply to the determinants of health in society. And it's not just poverty, but the gradient. My consistent theme is if you classify people by where they live, classify where they live by level of deprivation, the more deprived, the worse the health. Poor people have greater ill health than rich people, yep, but it's a gradient. 
and because of the gradient. In my 2010 English review, I coined the phrase proportionate universalism. The NHS is a universalist system. We, thank goodness, have not got a healthcare system for the poor. A healthcare system for the poor would be a poor healthcare system. An education system for the poor would be a poor education system. We've got a universalist system, but effort proportionate to need. I just showed you the spend by deprivation. More de deprivation, greater spend. Why? Because there's greater need. If you've got, as Sir Frank Atherton said, multi-morbidity, you need more spend proportionate to need. So I was trying to combine two principles. The classic British approach to social policy is you target means-tested benefits. The NHS principle, a Nordic principle, is universalist policies. So I said, let's have universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. You could call it leveling up, there you are. Social distribution, less deprivation, higher life expectancy, if we focus only on the worst of, we miss the health disadvantage of those above the threshold of intervention, but lower in the social hierarchy. So I said, we want universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. What did we get in England post 2010? This is spending by local authority per person, by quintile of the index of multiple deprivation. The gray bars are total spending. In the least deprived, 20% of areas, total spending went down by 17%. And then the greater the deprivation, the greater the reduction. In the most deprived, it went down by 32%. And here's adult social care, went down by 3% in the least deprived, went down by 17% in the most deprived. What we've got here is effort inversely proportionate to need. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. And in this decade, the rate of improvement in life expectancy slowed markedly, Health inequalities increased and life expectancy for the poorest people got worse. It's possible, quite possible, that this regressive social settlement did play a role in the slowdown in health improvement, the increase in inequalities, the decline in life expectancy in the poorest people. And it's not just England. We saw a decline in life expectancy in the poorest people in Wales. So why did we have these regressive cuts? We were told to make the economy grow. I was listening to the former chancellor uh, from 2010 on a podcast while I was out for a walk. I got a blister, I was so annoyed. He said, we took the tough decisions after 2010, and we were the envy of the rich countries. We were doing so well, he said. What? Real GDP per person? Deviation from the 1990 to 2007 trend. Here's the UK from 2010, down, 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 down. We were the envy of the rich countries of Germany, of Japan, of France, of the US, well, not even Italy. By 2021, our GDP per person was a third lower than it would have been had we continued on this 1990 to 2007 trend. 
So we took the tough decisions we were told. The reason we cut local authority spending and cut everything else was so the economy could grow, but it didn't grow. We were the envy of the rich countries. This was evolution of real annual average wages at constant uh, dollars went up into labor. And I'm not party political, I'm just reporting the data and then went down. And here are the peer countries. Look at the change since 2009 in real wages. We're the envy of these countries? Really? In 2022, real wages were lower than they were 18 years earlier. What kind of justification is that for slashing public services, including the NHS? And I want to talk about three challenges, intergenerational equity, action on the social determinants of health, and rediscovering the common good. Intergenerational equity, equity between the generations. The Gallup organization does a poll internationally. Do you think children today will have a better, worse, or roughly the same life to you? Better, Slovenia, 14%, Sweden, 21%. Better or um, there's a worse life. In the UK, only 31% of people say that children will have a better life. My goodness, my goodness. Think about the post-war generation. Everything we believed in was that children would be better off than their parents, their parents who suffered the depression and the war. Um, and that's somehow fundamental. The American dream, only 43% of optimistic Americans are optimistic about the future for their children. Now, part of that is the climate crisis, but it's social conditions. We don't think our children will have a better life than we do. We failed the next generation. And some justification for that pessimistic view. One way of looking at social mobility is to ask at the current rate of social mobility, if you're in the bottom 10% of income, how many generations would it take to get to the median? If you're in Denmark, it would take two generations to go from the bottom 10% to the median at the current rate of social mobility. If you're in Finland, Norway, or Sweden, it would take three generations. The average for the OECD, the rich countries, is 4.5. The UK and the US, it would take five generations. We have less social mobility than the average, and certainly a good deal less than the Nordic countries or Australia. In Brazil, it would take nine generations. Colleagues, I have bad news. We are moving towards Brazil, not towards Denmark. Why is that? I'll come to it in a moment. But look at these inequalities, and that's part of the reason. Obesity prevalence in year six, least deprived, most deprived. Adverse childhood experiences, following the social gradient, incarceration of parents, drug abuse, sexual abuse, alcohol abuse, domestic violence, physical abuse of children, mental illness in the parents, verbal abuse, and parental separation. All of these follow the social gradient. Why are we failing our children? At least in part, because of the magnitude of inequality, income, social, economic inequalities. 
And if we want to move towards the Danish, Norwegian, Finnish, Swedish level of social mobility, not towards the Brazilian level, we need action on the social determinants of health. In my 2010 and 2020 reviews, we had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all. Number four, highly relevant in a cost of living crisis, a healthy standard of living for all, healthy and sustainable places and communities, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. And we've added two, particularly number seven, in the light of the COVID evidence, tackle racism, discrimination, and their outcomes. And number eight should have been there all along, pursue environmental sustainability and health equity together. Well, how are we doing? If we've got low levels of social mobility, perhaps it's related to child poverty. Here's 41 rich countries, child poverty in Iceland, Czech, Denmark, Finland, Korea, Slovenia, and here's the UK. We rank 31 out of 41 countries. The US is worse. It ranks 38 out of 41 countries. How do we get to this point? Well, if you look at Finland and the US, child poverty in Finland, before fiscal policy, before tax and benefits, child poverty in Finland is higher than in the US. The Finns are really strange. They don't like their kids growing up in poverty. So they use the tax and benefit system to reduce child poverty. And guess what? The kids don't grow up in poverty. Ours do, and the Americans do. We seem to be quite comfortable condemning our children to poverty. And it is unfortunate. This is from the Food Foundation, food insecurity. Between January 2022 and January 2023, food insecurity doubled just under 22%, somewhere between one in four and one in five households with children had food insecurity. Relied on low cost food, not had balanced meals, not had enough to eat or skip meals. Wow. The JRF and the Trussell Trust calculated what the cost is of meeting essentials, food, home heating, clothing, transport. Universal credit pays 70% of what's needed to meet essentials. In other words, if you can't work and you're dependent on universal credit, we guarantee you will get sick. We will not give you enough to meet your basic needs. And that will increase your risk of illness. That's how we organize our affairs in society. And it relates to this. Compare countries, Norway and the United Kingdom. There's the US and Switzerland. If you're in the 90th centile, of income, adjusting for purchasing power. The UK is about as rich as Norway. In other words, people at the 90th centile, 10% from the top in the UK, about as rich as Norway, not as rich as Switzerland and the US, but we're about the same as Norway. There's Slovenia. If you're in the 50th centile, we're a lot poorer than Norway and a lot poorer than Switzerland and a lot poorer than the US. Slovenia is catching up. These are trends over time. 
So people in the middle of the income distribution in the UK are a good deal poorer than in Norway. Now look at the bottom 10%. The US is way down. Look how much poorer the UK is than Norway. We're poorer than in Slovenia. The UK is a poor country with some rich people. We've been deluding ourselves. We tell ourselves we're the fifth or sixth richest country on the planet. That's total GDP. GDP per person, we're about 25 ranking. And if you look at the distribution, we're really bad. The UK is a very bad place to be poor. And you can see it here. And you can see it in the food insecurity. This is the Bevan principle. That if the inequalities in meeting basic needs match the inequalities in income, we're in serious trouble. And that means we have to rediscover the common good. What kind of society do we want? Do we want a society that only works for people, those few rich people? And we can see our health is suffering, life expectancy more or less stopped improving, inequalities increased, life expectancy for the poorest people went down, probably breaking copyright by showing you Picasso's cartoon of Don Quixote. But when I was chairing the World Health Organization Commission on Social Determinants of Health, I said I felt like Don Quixote. I'd woken up, imagined myself a medieval knight rushing around the world trying to do chivalrous deeds, and I kind of thought maybe people were laughing at me. And I said this to the Spanish Minister of Health, who said, ah, we need the idealism of Don Quixote, the dreamer. But we need the pragmatism of Sancho Panza. And as I read the biography of Nye Bevan, I thought, yep, yeah, that describes him. He had the vision of Don Quixote, the dreamer, but he also had the pragmatism of Sancho Panza. He couldn't have created the NHS without both the vision and the pragmatism. And that is what we need to go forward. So let me finish, given that I'm steeped in Wales at the moment, with a quote from another Welshman. To be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Sir Michael, there. Uh, insightful, uh, as always. Um, I think we've got a little bit of time, not as much as we'd hoped for some questions. Um, uh, we've got some mics, so as they get set up, if you would mind, I'd like to ask a question of my own. Um, I remember you talking in Swansea in a Bevan Commission conference a few years ago and expressing frustration that a presenter or a journalist had asked you, what's the one key message that you'd like to get across? And you said, actually, it's all important, so forgive me if this is a journalist's question, but... How would you translate those insights you've just given into real policy decisions in Wales, given, of course, the straitjacket, I might argue, of the amount of resources the NHS is currently consuming? How do you make that leap? Well, I don't know if I said this two years ago, but if I didn't, I should have which is to put equity of health and well-being at the heart of all policy making. If the UK had done that in 2010, they would not have pursued the policies that they did because it was predictable that the policies of austerity would increase inequity of health and well-being. 
And as I've just shown you, it didn't work in its own terms. It didn't lead to economic growth. So we took policies that were actually damaging to the overall economy and increased inequities. So I would run that filter over everything we did. And I would start with saying, uh, I mean, it's not just economic. When I said we're a poor country with some rich people, um, that's not just about income, although I showed you the income figures. That's about the conditions to lead flourishing lives. They are most unequally distributed. And yeah, I'm aware of the intense constraints in the UK as a whole and in Wales in particular. But that's the filter I would run over all policy making. Thank you very much. Um, it's hard for me to see, but any hands up on the floor? Yes, towards the back there. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, one of the things that hasn't been discussed is the right to breathe clean air and the impact of air quality uh, as the widest determinants of health. Uh, we've been doing some air quality studies in a variety of different public spaces, indoors and outdoors. And quite frankly, it's like giving our population the ability to smoke 20 cigarettes a day by just living in particular areas and zones in Wales. And that's probably the same internationally. So there is something you can do about air quality, but people don't recognize that they can actually do something about it and how important it is. Uh, the facts show that air quality killed more people than COVID, and yet there's not the same urge to action to do anything about it. Thank you. Mr. Michael. We, we've got data. I mean, it comes into my number five, uh, healthy and sustainable places in which to live and work. And the data show very clearly a high correlation between the percent of people living in poverty and PM 2.5 concentrations. So a further blow to the health of people in deprivation is high levels of air pollution. And it's particularly worrying. Um, look at schools. The schools in deprived areas are exposed to higher concentrations of oxides of nitrogen and PM 2.5. So you're absolutely right. It's another insult and another cause of health inequalities. And of course, the thing about air pollution is if we burn fewer fossil fuels, we'll be helping with achieving net zero carbon emissions and helping with air pollution. So the two go together. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question right down here at the front, it's somebody you will know, Sir Michael, Nairi Bevan, a fellow Bevan Commissioner, of course, um, and the mic is just arriving now, so... Good morning, Professor. Um, I found that absolutely amazing, quite depressing in some, in some parts, um, particularly around we have failed the next generation, and I have to take some responsibility for that because I've been in social care and health for many, many years. Um, my kind of point really is, um, you answered it first with Owen really, because I was going to ask how do we do it in Wales, because yesterday we heard from a number of speakers about we are a small country, we can do it, uh, if anybody can, we can do it. So, but you've answered that really in terms of the social determinants. But some of your data, which is quite incredible, would be quite difficult to understand by some groups in society. And I was wondering, how can we get those big messages that you as have given us today to our citizens and the public in Wales? Because sometimes I think they need to have their eyes opened. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm thinking, I've been thinking about that for a long time, but I'm thinking about it even more intensely now. Uh, for me, the next, not, the next big challenge, but a next big challenge is to try and deal with your question, to try and get the message much more widely appreciated. Because uh, if you ask people, what do they think about health? They say, oh, it's so difficult to get to see the GP and have to wait in accident emergency. And that's all true, but it's housing and early childhood and all the things I talk about. And people don't quite appreciate that those are health issues. 
I don't want to leave you depressed. Uh, let me tell you why I'm not depressed. Um, Gwent is the first marmot region in Wales. Um, uh, we've had uh, cities, regions, local authorities all over England taking up the marmot principles, uh, the recommendations, but Gwent took it up. Five local authorities uh, in the Gwent region working hard to say, what can we do at local level? Not just, um, we need national action, of course. We want action in Westminster, we want action in Cardiff, uh, but what can we do in Gwent? Um, and it's really exciting. I was in Liverpool uh, earlier this week, um, the Cheshire and Merseyside is a Marmot region and great deprivation in parts of Cheshire and Merseyside, but they're working away at local level, absolutely committed to making a difference, not saying, oh, look, it's all awful. They've starved, of, starved us of resources. There's nothing we can do. They're saying, this is the hand with which we've been dealt. Now, let's do the best we can. And it's really encouraging. And we're setting up a monitoring system so we'll know whether the action in Gwent really made a difference or in Cheshire and Merseyside or Greater Manchester or north of Tyne, um, all the regions in which we've been working. We'll have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Ken, you show your appreciation to uh, Sir Michael Marmot, please.